Donc, bienvenue à tous pour cette deuxième phase de notre journée. Je vais présenter l'oratrice en anglais puisqu'elle parle anglais. Um, I'm not just pleased, but enormously pleased, and not only honored, but enormously honored to introduce uh, Ms. Henriette Esterhuisen. I don't think any, there could have been any better choice as her for our first keynote. Um, Henriette's uh, lifelong aim is to promote human rights and social justice, particularly in Africa, but also in a global framework. And the means towards this end that she's been tirelessly working on is the internet. So right now she is uh, the chair of the Internet Governance Forum's multi-stakeholder advisory group, en français, Groupe Consultatif Multipartite du Forum sur la Gouvernance de l'Internet. Donc c'est une agence de la, ou une branche des Nations Unies. Um, she's also been for many years executive director and she's now advisor of the Association for Progressive Communications um, and, uh, and she's their uh, director of policy and strategy. And finally, she's a member of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. So Henriette, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Danielle, and thank you very much um, to everyone um, who's here and for inviting me to this event, to the organizers of this important um, colloquium. I felt somewhat guilty um, traveling from South Africa all the way to Paris, but I also felt it was a commitment to normality and to us um, maybe not working with normality, but 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 being adapting to a subnormal or semi-normal context, but still maintaining our connectedness and our collaboration for, for good things. So I was asked to talk about um, reshaping our digital ecosystem and, and solutions for a renewal. And in fact, that's what was discussed this morning as well. Um, and I really like this idea of the enlightenment. I'm not I'm critical of it, but it's such a powerful concept, and I think it has been such a powerful concept um, um, for, for many of us that are striving for human rights being a driving force on how we shape our societies. Um, but so how do we deal with this? We've actually come full circle um, around regulation. Many of you who were involved in internet governance um, for the last 20 years, like my friend Nena, who's in the room with us, who were part of the World Summit on the Information Society, would know that there has been or was for a long time this notion that a free and open internet has to be an unregulated internet, to be a free and open internet. There's the notion that the Internet Society promotes of permissionless innovation. The fact that you invent first, you develop a new app first, um, a new business model, and then if there are harmful consequences, then you start talking about it. Very different from other sectors, um, such as the development of vaccines, for example. Um, and and in, in fact, it, is been, it has been quite unique that this identity of an open and free internet is so closely associated with this libertarian approach. Um, where there is no regulation and where governments are not actively involved. Now there's a lot of receptiveness towards this. We have national legislatures talking about uh, regulating the internet. And many of them are. Uh, courts are dealing with the internet. Uh, regional intergovernmental uh, institutions. The European Commission has been leading the way in developing regulation that addresses internet-related challenges. And um, we've also seen more self-regulation emerge from industry, the Facebook Oversight Board, for example, to deal with content-related um, concerns. Um, so where does this um, put us, and how does this relate to reshaping uh, uh, the digital ecosystem to be more public interest oriented? I 
think we absolutely have to talk about regulation. But I think we also need to pause and reflect quite carefully in how we approach this. Um, how do we get the best out of this, this invention that touches so many aspects of our personal, social, political, and, and economic lives? I think the first thing, that, the first point I really want to make here is that we should not blame the technology. And in fact, even listening to the conversation earlier this morning, I think people vacillate between um, locating the challenges that we experience um, on the internet or through the internet um, in, you know, onto the network, onto the tools, onto the platforms, onto the companies that operate on that platform. Um, and my argument would be that that's not the right place to start. We have to look at the internet not as something that operates in a par parallel dimension. The internet is human, and the good things that happen on the internet are human, and the bad things are human. Um, so innovation is disruptive, uh, whether it is technical or at the level of di ideas. Sometimes that disruption can have positive con consequences, sometimes it can have negative consequences. So I think what we really need to look at is, is what is it in our societies that amplify or that, is, that are amplified by um, certain aspects of the internet. So to put it more succinctly, before we talk about the damage that technology does to our democracies, let's reflect on the quality, the sustainability of these democracies. Um, we live in an imperfect world. Um, but it's a very connected wor world. And um, the internet has made this interconnection possible in ways that we couldn't imagine 50 or 100 years ago. But ultimately, the connectedness is not new um, throughout history. Conquest, colonialism, um, the north, the south, the west, the east um, have been connected. Culture, culture everywhere is a product of uh, interchange um, between different parts of the world, different languages, different communities. So rather than think about what's wrong about the internet, let's think about what are the values that we really care about and that we feel create more uh, or contribute to more participative and just societies. And then we look at how we can secure those on the internet. Um, for me, the most important of these values are, and I think they are linked to the Enlightenment, even if they might be broader than, than what would have been the light Enlightenment um, when it was first conceived of. Firstly, equality. I think social and economic equality remains what breaks our world. It's at the source of, of refugees, of migration, of poverty and hunger, and often it's also at the source of, of uh, war and conflict. Inequality is, is vast, and in some ways it's even growing, and we've seen that in the pandemic, how in poor parts of the world, people are poorer, they are more deprived, they are more marginalized. Um, these are social inequality and economic inequalities. Um, so how do we strive for this um, um, on the internet and also through the internet? Next, I think there is truth. Truth is extremely important, and I think we sometimes in the contemporary world, we're reluctant to talk about truth because we abstract everything and we know that there's diversity and plura plurality of views. But for me, truth is not so much the argument that there's one single truth, but that we try and strive for truth. That's what science does. That is what research does. It's trying to, to look at... Um, where are falsehoods? Uh, where is there misinformation? Is it being spread deliberately uh, or by accident? And this is a very real issue on the internet and something I think that we need to really address when we look at regulation uh, and governance. How do we hold those that spread falsehoods accountable? But we also need to value truth in our societies. We can't just uh, approach uh, the spread of disinformation on the internet if we don't have as values um, in our educational systems, if we don't encourage critical thinking, and if we don't value um, that process of seeking and trying to establish truth with diversity, obviously. Justice and fairness, you know, these are also very fundamental values that we, that we rely on for inclusive democratic societies. Fair and equal treatment under the law, 
fairness in the workplace, rights for workers, wherever they are and, and whatever kind of work they do, fairness in the marketplace, um, the opportunity. Someone, I think Gabriela Ramos was talking about small businesses, the ability for, for new entrants in the market to, to innovate and, 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 and to, to um, create. Um, taxation, another uh, incredibly important issue. So much of society and, and what we've achieved in contemporary democracies, particularly in social democratic oriented um, political systems, relies on fair taxation. Um, and contestation and working through that contestation about what is fair taxation of individuals and of companies and obviously of how the public sector then uses um, the revenue generated in that way. And, and then next, human rights. Um, this is a value that underpins, I think, everything that we try and achieve when we create enlightened, fair, democratic societies. Um, and human rights are both a very important set of values in their own right. Um, but they are also a means to achieving um, other rights, a, a means to striving for equality, a means to ensure that workers have the rights to, to, to fight and lobby for their interests and so on. So human rights, particularly freedom of expression, but not only freedom of expression, enable so much else. And then lastly, environmental sustainability. Um, how do we continue to exist as a species, as, a, as, a, as, as human beings, in a world in which climate change is affecting people very profoundly? Um, how do we ensure that our natural environment is respected, is protected, um, in a way that, that can contribute to long, sustainable quality of life for everyone? So how have we always protected these things, or how have we tried to protect them? I think we do it through a combination of laws, regulation, yes. Um, we develop political systems such as participative democracies. They're imperfect, but they, but they work. Um, and I think beyond that, and I won't go to, you know, through too many examples, but I think what really has been extremely important for us in, in protecting and promoting these values that I've talked about justice, fairness, um, protection of the environment, um, human rights, um, and equality are institutions. And I think that when we look at internet governance, we really need to think about what are the institutions that we need? What's the institutional framework that we should be looking at? And I, in fact, someone in the room asked a question around that. Um, we need institutions in society um, to uphold these values, to monitor laws, and policy to monitor the behavior of states. We need educational institutions, cultural, research. Um, we need these institutions to fall both within the public and the private domain. Um, some need to be from civil society, some might be in industry. But this diversity of institutions that, that we can work with and through to protect and promote the values that I was talking about, I believe are really fundamental. And without such an institutional framework to protect and promote public space, public goods and resources, we actually will not be able to succeed or even maintain um, securing the, 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 the public spaces and the rights that we already have, never mind protecting them as they are often eroded. And one saw that so clearly in the regime of the, the, the previous US president, President Trump, that ultimately his legacy has been in damage done to institutions. It's, it's not just, you know, we all have populist politicians sometimes in our countries. My country has just come through, South Africa went through a period of 10 years of enormously destructive um, regime, um, which was led by a populist. What has seen us through that? courts, a constitution, human rights institutions. So the value of these institutions in general should not be underestimated and they should not be underestimated um, in the context of the internet. So how do we move on? I think we have to work with what we have and we have to look at what we don't have. Where's the gap? I think what we have is a set of processes and institutions, traditions and mechanisms 
and that really can be applied to create a fairer, open, um, and rights-respecting internet. And I think this morning we already had a present. We, we had a speaker from a data protection agency. That's an example of that institutions, that type of institution. Um, we have traditions of independent media, and we have mechanisms that have developed in many parts of the world of upholding press freedom. We have mechanisms for challenging false advertising um, or advertising that is racist or sexist in nature. Um, and there's a plethora of these types of institutions. We have the labor movement, maybe not as strong now as it was in previous years, but it's shrinking and it's shrinking in many ways because the, the, the workplace is changing. But how do we find ways of reorganizing these transformed workplaces in a way that can bring us back to the principle of protecting the rights of, of workers. Um, there are more examples, and, and, and I won't dwell on all of them. I think the point here is that we need to look at what institutions we have, how can they develop the capacity to apply themselves to this emerging world of digital um, regulatory and policy challenges. Um, UNESCO's tools that they've developed, the Internet Universality Principles, for example, there's a set of tools that we can use that cross over uh, valuing and measuring whether the Internet is with, in its own governance complying with rights, but also in how it's being used at a national level. Um, I think the, 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 oh, another example here that I wanted to stress is that we have particularly in the context of the Internet develop the idea of the multi-stakeholder approach, the notion of bottom-up inclusive governance. Um, and that is something that we also need to work with and improve and strengthen. It's not perfect, but it gives us that principle of inclusiveness. So what don't we have? I think what we don't have uh, to drive and underpin uh, how we begin to look at regulating the internet and, and governing the internet in a more public-oriented way is a globally agreed set of principles. Um, we have some of that. We have the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspaces, norm to protect the public core, which was echoed in the Paris call um, on, on trust and security. Um, and, and we have human rights resolutions at the Human Rights Council, which very clearly articulate our existing human rights framework, civil and political and economic and social and cultural apply to the internet. But what we don't have is an agreed understanding um, in multi-stakeholder fora and in multilateral or even at national level um, of the internet as a public good or as a commons. And that is an argument that's been made, it's been defeated, it continues. But I believe that that's at the core of giving us the tools that we need to ensure that internet policy and regulation will protect the public interest, whether we look at it in the, the Eleanor Ostrom sense of a commons or whether we look at it more as a global public good, I think that needs to be explored. But that, I think, is at the heart of what we need to do. And then we need a set of principles um, that can be quite simple, that can be soft law. As, as Gabriela was saying, soft law makes a difference. We had the Net Mondial, Demi Getchko, we had earlier the Net Mondial Statement developed in 2014 in a bottom-up way, in a multi-stakeholder way, remains, in my view, the most powerful and, and at the same time the simplest um, set of guidelines for how to approach internet policy and regulation. But my time is up, so I will stop on this. I just want to say that as we go towards um, thinking about regulating the internet, I would say let's not think about regulating the internet. Uh, through regulating Facebook or regulating one particular business model. We have to think at this of the system as a whole. The internet is not just the web. It's not just the platforms that operate in it. We don't even know yet what new applications and tools can be developed um, based on the internet or that use the internet that uh, will um, come with new challenges. So in taking this path forward, let's look at that, the nature of the internet, and let's not work at the symptoms. Let's
go and look at the business models. Let's look at the fundamental, a big picture. Let's remember it's interconnected, it crosses border, and there are limitations to what can be done to intervene at a national level. And in fact, you can have harmful consequences of internet regulation that is, it takes place in one jurisdiction, but that can then affect people in others who are not part of that jurisdiction. And then finally, human rights. This is a system of principles. It's global, it's international, it's perfectly suited to the internet. It mirrors the internet in so many respects. So let's always use uh, international human rights standards and frameworks as the ultimate check and balance when we develop regulation and we test the impact of that regulation um, on those human rights frameworks. I'm very sorry I went over time. <laughs> So thank you so much for such a stimulating and rich uh, and optimistic yet realistic message. Thank you so much. Uh, there's uh, not much time, unfortunately, for questions, but there is time for a couple of questions in, in the room or via Zoom. Um, here we go. There's a question there. Thank you yet so much for this fantastic uh, um, uh, keynote speech. Um, you mentioned the Internet Universality uh, uh, Framework of UNESCO. Um, and uh, so I'm going to ask you, what can we do uh, in order for this framework to be expanded and adopted you know, more widely uh, and uh, embraced more widely you know, around the world? Um, <laughs> I, think, I think you know the answer to that. I think it's making people aware of it. It's finding the resources to use it. It's volunteering. It's for institutions, governments, um, partnerships to, to, to volunteer to use it or to use aspects of it. It's powerful because it's a conversational tool and a research tool together where you talk about how you do the research, you do the research together, and then you analyze the, 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 the results together. So it can bring government, other stakeholders, it can bring the educational sector together with the telecommunications sector, for example. So I think it gives us that integrated approach that we really need to, to that we need to in order to understand what the challenges are and what the solutions are, solutions are in that interfacing between the internet and society. Thank you. I have a, I have a Zoom question, uh, which is more or less as follows. It's in French, but I'll translate it into English. So the question starts with how can we seek information when experts themselves contradict themselves. A very important dimension of critical, uh, of the critical mind, critical thinking, uh, is logic. We're too often governed by our emotions and the digital world contributes to this emotional dimension. I think that's what I talked about when I, when I talked about the importance of tru truth. I think that's not a new conflict. I mm. think uh, plurality of media is a way in which we can deal with that. Um, tolerance, the, the tradition of actually listening to people, reading, um, is, is important. So I think we deal with that really um, by, by using the tools, the educational, the philosophical, the, the, the analytical tools that we know work and ensuring that that can be applied and how people interact with the internet and in how companies that distribute information on the internet um, do so and then create checks and balances where they can be held accountable for manipulating or abusing or disrupting that process of people actually to engage with plurality of views and content. Thank you very much. Um, there's one more question. I had one, but I will probably have to give it up. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Henry. I wanted to come back to things we hear every day, people saying we want to regulate the internet. We want to regulate the internet. Someone has a problem with Facebook and he wants to regulate the internet. Someone has a problem with an e-commerce site, he wants to regulate the internet. Someone has uh, mm -hmm. something he considers to be defamation online, and they want to regulate the internet. So my question is coming back to the word regulate and linking it to the internet. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Because almost every um, 
conference session I attend, someone is going to ask that question. And it's generally because this person is either speaking about hate speech or about content on the social media platform, but then they will say, we want to regulate the internet. Regulation meaning uh, tone it down, clamp it up, shut it up, mm -hmm. or any other thing that you want to talk, uh, we may want to think of. So how do you see that those two words, regulate and internet in one single swoop? Um, I think you don't use them in that way. You, you look at regulation as a tool that needs to be applied very specifically to address specific problems. So um, you regulate the business models and particular aspects of those business models that have harmful consequences. So even to talk about regulating Facebook or GAFA is not particularly helpful. You have to regulate abuse of data collection and gathering. You have to regulate um, manipulation and, and of content um, that amplifies extremist content. These are all very different. And then you have to look at regulation um, for taxation um, and for competition. So I think we have to look at what kind of society do we want, what kind of marketplace do we want um, in a digitalized world, and then we regulate to achieve that. We don't regulate the internet. One more question, but I'll have to skip. Join me in thanking very much Henriette for her excellent talk. Thank you very much.